So welcome back. Now that we've covered some concepts on waves, let's go over wave propagation and how electromagnetic waves travel through a medium. In this topic, we will be covering transverse electromagnetic waves, and I'll cover what that means in just a second. First, let's remember that for this topic and for electromagnetics, we we will usually be covering sinusoidal waves that behave in a way that can be described with phasers. So I just wanted to review really quickly that for a wave that is described with an amplitude A cosine omega t plus phi, we need to remember that the phasor of this will become A flat with an angle of phi. So just remember that when we are talking about phasors and what to do with them, remember that for phasor algebra, when we multiply, we have to keep it in phasor form. And if we want to add and subtract, we have to change it to rectangular form. So it would be V plus CJ. So this is for addition and subtraction. This is for multiplication and division. So just keep that in mind while we go through all of these formulas. Now let's go over what a transverse electromagnetic wave means. What this means is that the electric field and the magnetic field will be perpendicular to each other and the direction of propagation will be perpendicular to those two vectors. Let me make a drawing to make this easier to understand. So say this is the Cartesian plane, and we have x, we have y, and we have z. What transverse basically means is that if the electric field is pointing in the x direction, that the magnetic field will be pointing in either the y or the z direction. In this case, I'll just choose y and that the direction of propagation will be uh, in the direction of the cross product of E and H. So the direction, which we will call K hat, will equal the, and we're talking about directions here, E cross H. So this is not equal as in equal to the magnitude, it's equal in direction. And remember, my previous videos where I explain how to use the right hand rule. We're going to put our right hand and the fingers, the four fingers of our right hand in the direction of E, and then we'll curl them towards the second vector, which is H, and wherever our thumb is pointing is the direction of propagation. So if you did that correctly, you will have realized that the direction of propagation is going to be in positive Z direction. So if we were to visualize this as two sine waves, you'll come up with an image that is very popular in electromagnetics. And it is going to be the image where this, let me just make some room, where we see a sine wave on this plane. And then we also see a sine wave for the magnetic field on the other plane. And this would be the direction K. We're also going to use some other terms such as wavelength, which will be denoted as lambda. And this will be the kind of wave that we will be covering and probably one of the most important waves. It's also very similar to waves in, it's not very similar, an example of these kind of waves are waves that travel through transmission lines. So it's definitely something very useful and a great application of electromagnetics. I'll save the drawing for reference. And now let's go over intrinsic impedance. So now let's go over intrinsic impedance. Intrinsic impedance will be a property of the medium in which this wave propagates. It's going to determine a bunch of characteristics of how the wave will travel through it and will be a very important variable to find. Usually in exam problems, they'll make you find this first when dealing with wave propagation. Intrinsic impedance is written with the symbol eta, which is kind of like a curly N. 
and it will be equal to the, in this case, k is not the direction of that propagation. It is actually the number of the wave. k would be given as omega square root of phase velocity epsilon. But in any case, you'll almost never use this formula. What you're going to use is going to be if you plug in k, this into k, you'll get that eta is equal to the square root of mu over epsilon in lossless medium. So this is a very important assumption, and to be honest, most of the time for this topic, we'll always be dealing in lossless medium. Lossy media just makes it a little bit more complicated, and so that's why usually they'll prefer to do lossless. And so this is a good formula to remember with regards to intrinsic impedance. I just wanted to show how, you know, you get there. Now, in order to find the phase velocity, let's just clarify what mu means here. Mu will equal the permeability of the medium. So just remember that from our previous chapters on magnetostatics. I believe it was covered. So knowing that, we can find the phase velocity, u of p, which will equal 1 over square root of mu epsilon. And then we can find the length of the wave by doing the phase velocity over the frequency. So these three equations are very important equations that you definitely want to remember when dealing with waves. And something to note here is that this equation and this equation are only dependent on the medium, not the wave itself. Both mu and epsilon are medium properties. They represent the permeability and permittivity of the medium. So very much write down and keep these in mind. Note how a problem can be formulated for you to find the wavelength of a transverse wave by only giving you mu and epsilon. So just think about how a problem like that could be solved. Now let's go over a relation between the electric and magnetic fields. In phasor form, this is kind of a constant formula to remember. When these fields are linked, we know that the magnetic field will be 1 over eta times k hat cross E phasor. And we also know that E phasor will equal negative eta times k hat cross H phasor. So this is a very quick way to find its linked counterpart in a transverse electromagnetic wave. So these are also very important formulas to remember. And that's mostly it on wave propagation. So thank you for watching and I really hope this was helpful.